Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. So what I'm going to do is talk about a little bit of the research we have been doing in our lab, uh, looking at how uh, behavior and personality gets expressed in the real world. Before getting started, I have a question for you. Can you hear me at the back? That's, that's not the question. That's a pre-question. Okay. All, right. Uh, all right. So I want you to place yourselves on these personality traits. Think about these. Where do you stand? On extroversion, are you more like Bill Gates? Are you like more like Muhammad Ali? A conscientiousness, more like Pig Pen? Are you more like Robocop? <laughs> or are you neurotic? Are you more like the dude from the Big Lebowski? Or more like Woody Allen? So I want you to just think about where you are on those traits, and we will be coming back to it later. Next thing before we get started, I want to do is uh, thank my many, many collaborators. Uh, I won't have time when going through the studies to thank them in person, but I want to be uh, absolutely clear that everything I've done here has been collaborative in, in every way, in many of the stuff I'm going to be talking about has been done, has been led by some of these people, probably in today's talk, uh, Gabrielle Harari is the person who has done most of the relevant work. In fact, here are some of them I'm about to show you. So anyway, so here we are, uh, there are some of my collaborators. Um, and me. Uh, so here, here we engage in behavior in the real world, and we as behavioral scientists presumably should have some interest in capturing what people do in the real world. This was a photo taken when we were at a, uh, a breakfast before a conference in Brazil, and we were having breakfast, and we were just engaging in behavior. How do we capture behavior? So the traditional approach has been, well, the, one of the things is we can ask people about that behavior. We will ask them in a self-report, typically questionnaire, or we will try to um, recreate that behavior or some version of that behavior or that situation in the lab, and that will allow us to monitor it and therefore get some idea of what is going on. But as many people have pointed out, there are many problems with these kinds of things. Self-reports, there are all kinds of issues with self-reports. If I asked you, but I do ask you now, how many conversations have you had in the past three days? Uh, you would have no idea. You have absolutely no idea. If I asked you how many minutes you have been speaking, you'd have no idea. Right? You'd, have, you'd really have no idea. And even, you know, even, so all kinds of things, we just, so our memory is not very good. There are all kinds of issues with social desirability. It's annoying to constantly be asked things. Uh, about if we were trying to ask you, it interferes with your life, it interferes with what you're doing. If I ask you in the moment what's going on, that may make you think about things and behave in a different way than otherwise. In the lab, how closely does the lab really reflect what's going on outside in the real world? So for these sorts of reasons, there have been numer numerous attempts to try to find other ways of actually measuring what people are doing. So, uh, so like one of the early attempts was by this famous study by Parker and Wright, who followed around this this uh, seven-year-old boy Raymond Birch, as they as they called him, from so they and yet they followed him from the minute he woke up at seven something in the morning to the minute he went to bed, and they would follow him around with their notepads and write down everything he did. He put on the left sock. He now put on the right sock. His mother came in and said, "It's time for breakfast." And they followed him around, and every half hour they'd swap around with another team. And as you can imagine, right, this is a good way of perhaps getting a behavior, but it's, it's tremendously burdensome on the researchers and on Raymond Birch. It may affect what Raymond Birch does with, to have a team of researchers following him around all day. And then what do you do with the data? You have these, book, these folders and folders full of data. How do you deal with them? Now, one of the people to talk about this is one of my former advisors, uh, Ken Craig, and he developed what he called the Live Day approach, which was a kind of updated version of the uh, of the Live of Barker and Wright's um, uh, approach to Raymond Birch. And he would follow people around with video cameras the whole day. So you didn't have to write down, but he'd follow you around. But again, what do you do with those videos? How do you process them? And it's tremendously intrusive. More recently, there's been approach from. Um, uh, pioneered by Jamie Pennebaker and Matthias Mell, called the EAR, the Electronically Activated Recorder, which in olden days used to look like this. So it was a little century recorder you'd carry around with you, and it comes on for 30 seconds every 12 minutes and just records whatever is going on. Uh, and this has been updated. There are now, of course, smartphone versions of this, 
where it essentially records what's going on. But again, you have this issue of how do you deal with those data? It only collects some forms of data, not others. Another thing that, um, that uh, Ken Craig always, there is no better photo of him, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> another thing Ken Craig always used to talk about, and he always used to say, well, you know, everything we do is relevant to personality, or potentially relevant to personality. So while working with him, that I thought, well, look, maybe we can't just go and measure behaviors themselves because they are intrusive, because it is so uh, burdensome to do so. But it's possible that some behaviors leave a, 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 a residue in their wake. And if, just as a detective or Sherlock Holmes would try to understand our behavior from the residue we leave, isn't it possible that we as psychologists can get a glimpse into some uh, forms of behavior no. by looking at the residue in physical spaces? So this sort of started off with my interest in physical spaces. So these are two dorm rooms from the University of Texas. And what is interesting is that on the first day of the semester, these two rooms would have looked identical, absolutely identical. But you would have said, I was showing you the same photo twice, is what you would have thought was happening, because they would have looked so similar. Right? However, just a few months into the, uh, into the semester, and they looked very different. And they looked very different because yeah, we can be bold and causal here because of things the occupants have done. So my idea here was, look, can we use this residue to infer the behaviors that led to this, uh, led to these, um, this residue, and therefore the psychological characteristics, and in my case, I was interested in personality, the personality associate, uh, characteristics associated with those behaviors. But it was once I started looking at these spaces, I began to realize there are many more things in these spaces than just the residue of inadvertent behaviors. So for example, many of the things are put here deliberately as not as inadvertent traces. You look at the, you look at the poster over here, and the poster over here, and the postcards up here. And so these are what I call um, uh, identity claims. So these are sorts of deliberate things we put up to say, to make claims to other people. Say, hey world, I want to broadcast something to you about my attitudes and values. So the sorts of things you would see on a bumper sticker, or the sorts of things that I can see right now on people's t-shirts, right? You are telling people, hey world, this is something about me and I want you to know it, right? There's deliberate statements to the world. Here we see this person's Look at this person's certificates and awards and so on. What tells us that these are identity claims? Well, look where they're placed. The person sits on the chair and faces out, right? The person isn't looking at them. The, the person is framed by them when others come in. Now, does this mean that it is um, a you know, manipulative, um, disingenuous uh, claim? Probably not. There's been a lot of work. So for example, a lot of the work uh, by Bill Swan has shown in self-verification of people try to bring others to see them as they see themselves. And they're happier and healthier and more productive when they're able to do that. This was one of the doors from one of the dorm rooms we studied in one of our studies. So look, before you even cross the doorway, the threshold of the door, you're learning things about this person. Right? We put a brain in the White House, be your own goddess, etc. So this person is saying things to others. And remember, the, the occupant, him or herself, is on the other side. They're not looking at this. They see it briefly as they go in, but it's more about sending signals to other people. So that's one way we change the environment around us. Another way we change the environment is deliberate, but it's not as a communicative uh, uh, um, force. It's more to try to affect the way we think and feel. So perhaps the most obvious way we do that is we listen to music. Think about when you listen to music. And how do you decide what to listen to? You almost certainly listen to something different when you, if you're going to the gym and want to work out than if you want to relax after a stressful day at work. We use music to try to regulate our thoughts and feelings, and we also do the same thing with environments. So here in people's workplaces, they have, they have um, like little photos of, of important people, places, or times, 
and uh, Wendy Garner and Cindy Pickett have called all these um, social snacks. It's the idea is you're, you're at work, you're looking at your computer, and then you think, oh, I'm missing my baby, and then I'll look at, oh, there's my baby, and then you feel a little better. It kind of, it kind of, it kind of replenishes your kind of your connection with that. And probably most of you, if you look at your phone, if you have something on your phone, it's probably an important person, place, or something like that, something to allow you to connect with that person or that thing or that place while you're away from it. So here we see a couple of offices of, um, uh, of people high, uh, of, of, of people, uh, thought, what I call these thought and feeling regulators. So this is, right, one of these is an extrovert, one of these is an introvert. Right? What do we know about extroverts? We know from our research, right, we know what they just like to be around people. They like, they, um, they have on the, they have more friends on Facebook, they have more uh, connections. They, um, they even like, compared to introverts, they even like music with vocals in it compared to introverts. So what do we see? They like people. So here, here, here is our extroverts office. Look what they have. There's people, 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 people. <laughs> I've run out of space. More people, people, people. <laughs> here we have the introvert. But there's a tree, <laughs> and a duck over there, okay? right? So you can just see, what does this one have said? This one is saying, yeah, it's exciting to say, down, regulate, perhaps you're saying, calm down, right? We get pretty important to learn this one, things to be a bit, a bit boring. So then the, the final uh, way we leave trace of our personality is the one I mentioned earlier, which is behavioral residue. So we have residue in our spaces, if we're being Sherlock Holmes, not only to um, things that go on in the space, but presumably like surfing, snowboarding, skateboarding, things that also go outside. So there's lots of clues to the kind of behavior people engage in. And the question I have was, are we able to try to figure out the behaviors just from looking at these clues and therefore figure out what the person is like? Here is another one of the rooms we study. This is a behavioral residue. You see traces of things that this person has or has not done which leaves the trace in the, in the way. And here we go, here you see two officers again. There is there's my introvert, see there's the tree, and in fact that's my collaborator, some means here, in our office. And so if so I look at these two offices here, look, this, my office looks more like this, where you essentially have these layers of sediment that get filled up over the years. You just have to do something and put it down. Whereas look at this, look at this clean desk here, all the pencils sharpened and facing the same way, and the pencil holder, the staplers next to each other, nicely lined up, the, everything, and look, and look, the, look, the satisfaction on his <laughs> clear, look at that clear desk, right? And so these are reflecting different sorts of behavior. So just, just to um, first get a sense for, can these other sorts of traces that are in the world, can we use those to get a sense? That was the first study I did. So what I did, not knowing if we'd be able to learn about people, is I sent my team of researchers into the rooms, and I just said, go into some dorm rooms. Of course, we covered up their names, we covered up just the, the faces of the photos, and I said, can you try to tell me what this person is like? Can you tell me what their personality is like? Fill out a personality questionnaire about them. Um, and they did so in terms of what's known as the big five personality dimensions, so I don't know uh, how, who here knows the big five personality dimensions sufficiently well that if I call on you, you could tell me what they are? Okay, so some people, all right, I just want to, all right, I'm not going to call on you, I just want to really make sure. Okay, so I'm just going to very briefly go over them. So the big five personality dimensions suggest that there are five broad dimensions of personality, and we all have scores in all or five of them, and uh, essentially um, this captures much of the variance in sort of personality traits. Um, and, we, and, and, what, and it isn't intrinsically better to be bet high or low on any of these traits. And they can be thought of as o ocean, they spell the personality, ocean, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. So openness sort of distinguishes those people who kind of like to, who, for, for, for whom uncertainty is kind of interesting and engaging versus people who are more um, concrete, they're more traditional, um, they're more conventional, and the high-end people are, tend to be imagined, and curious, and creative. Oh, I have, I've got icons for each one. So Leonardo is my icon for openness, right? The classic quintessential man, he's an astronomer, a biologist, an inventor, a, a painter, a politician, all kinds of things, right? So these are people who are broadly interested in many things. 
conscientiousness, you've already seen my icon for this. That is Robocop, who you'll remember was half man, half machine, all cop. Um, and, so, and this is really essentially about frontal lobe stuff. It's about thinking before you act. It's inhibiting impulses. It's being planful. So these sorts of people get, some, get supplies before they run out. They turn up to tar on time to appointments. They have neat, tidy places. Uh, extroversion, that was uh, uh, Eddie Murphy in any of the characters you've ever played. These people are outgoing, they're engaged, they love, they're cheerful, versus people who prefer to do things uh, alone, who are quiet, who like to spend time alone. Agreeableness, my icon is uh, Mr. Rogers, who, who those of you, I guess people everyone knows Mr. Rogers here, uh, he, you know, who was famously nice, so nice that when he had his car stolen once, there was a story about it, and his car would return the next day, saying, if we'd known it was your car, we wouldn't have stolen it. <laughs> kind, warm-hearted, cooperative, sympathetic, those people are going to be harsh and bold and tell you like it is. Neuroticism, these people are essentially sensitive to what can go wrong in the world, sensitive to threat. Um, they're anxious, they're on, they tend to be more moody, versus people on the other end who are calm and... Uh, uh, my icon for this is, of course, Woody Allen. So the, so the team, what happened in this was my team went through trying to judge the personality of the occupants just on the basis of these of their bedrooms. I also sent another team who went through and recorded all of the physical features in their spaces so we could see which physical features were associated with what the occupants were really like and what the, uh, how they were judged to be. Um, and then, uh, right, and then finally, I also had, um, we also got validity data on what the occupants were really like, which were self-report questionnaires filled out by the occupants, but for all the reasons I mentioned, self-reports are questionable. We also had two other people who knew the informants well rate their personality. So by accuracy, in this case, what I mean is the correspondence between the people who had only seen your room and what the combination of the, of the occupant and two of his or her friends said about the occupant. That's what I mean. Okay, now, so what I want you to do now is I want you to guess which traits were people accurate for, okay? So I'm going to show you the big five, and these are just dorms. So I'm not asking you to make a judgment about these two dorms, right? I'm just saying overall, over the 83 different dorm rooms we looked at, which of them, was, for which personality trait, was their most accuracy in the judgments? Okay? So here are the big five again. So I'm going to ask you to vote. There is an answer here. Which, which personality trait has the most accuracy? Okay? So who is not going to vote? <laughs> All right, very good. Okay, so who thinks openness was the most accurately judged? Who thinks openness was the most accurately judged? Zero percent of you. Okay, who thinks conscientiousness was the most accurately judged? That is 82% of you. All right. <laughs> Extroversion? All right, that is 13% uh, of you. Agreeableness? Zero percent of you. Neuroticism? Amazing, that is four percent of you. All right. <laughs> well, uh, like you, I, I predicted that conscientiousness would be the most accurately judged personality trait, and indeed it is pretty accurately uh, judged. But it is not at all the most accurately judged personality trait on the basis of people's dorms. In fact, Everybody who came to this lecture has learned something, because none of you got it right today. In fact, openness is by far the most accurately just personality trait on the basis of snooping around uh, some, some one dorm room. Um, so, so what this suggests to me is that, you know, that going through is there is information in behavioral residue. That there, and the question is, and as Ken, would have, Ken Craig would also always have said, there are so many different ways in which personality can get expressed. So you can think of all the domains where it could be. It could be on your answer machine message, your nationality, your writing, your underwear, your password, your music preferences, your resume. There's all kinds of ways in which personality could leak out just a little bit, all right? Potentially. And they, of course, vary in how public and private they are. Your location is more public than your thoughts. 
and how much control you have over them. You have a lot of control over those things on the right, less control over those things on the left. And, you know, and so presumably that would be helpful if you were snooping around somewhere and you wanted to, you thought somebody was trying to fool you. You, you would be able to like compare the places where they had, they thought were public and had high, high control over the places they thought were private. So what this led me to believe is, is it sort of says, well, given that personality and other psychological traits may leak out in so many different ways, how can we begin to like begin to scrape these different indicators of what's going on and make sense of them from a psychological uh, perspective? And so this is what I really want to talk about today is all these sorts of new opportunities there are for collecting data. So many of, many of these things is the behavior already occurs in a form where it can be harvested. Um, and also, there's now new technologies for gathering these data. And that's what I mean in the title of my talk, where I say there are really now no excuses for not studying people, real people in the real world. I can forgive you if you were a psychologist in the 1980s or 1990s or 2000s, where you say, well, you really didn't have a better alternative. You have to follow somebody around with a video camera. But now that's not true. We have so many other alternatives for being able to assess behavior. So for example, perhaps one of the, the leading person in the domain of collecting the sort of traces we leave in our way <coughs> of social media is Michal Kaczynski, who has done a lot of work looking at uh, Facebook and collecting data from Facebook. As many of you may know, he was the one who sort of pioneered collecting Facebook likes. The, the, that's the work that's now getting a lot of heat, of course, through Cambridge Analytica, who used essentially the same methods to try and identify people's uh, political orientation and send them uh, ads accordingly. But he has done a lot of work being able to scrape the various things that people have on their Facebook profile and using those to predict um, all kinds of psychological variables, things like personality, but also things like uh, 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 gender, uh, age, uh, all kinds of, uh, many, 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 many others, uh, too. There are other ways that we can now begin to collect data. So one of my favorite psychologists of all, Tali Arconi, who always does amazing, interesting stuff. I'm going to talk about his study in a second. He's collecting the, what are the words people talk about? People are now, you know, right now, people are writing blogs. Well, there is some data that we can collect and make psychological sense out of. There's some other work looking at like how we use keystrokes. Do we hit the keystrokes very hard when we type it? Do we come into it more hesitating? Do we use the backspace box? There's lots of things we can use that might give some insight to um, into people's psychology. Is looking at people's keystrokes going to give us a full account of their personality? No, of course not. Of course not. And keystroke and how you hit the keystroke is going to be multiply determined by many things. But the world is so complicated, right, that we're never going to be able to find something, we're never going to be able to find some indicator just by looking at one thing. Right? What we have to do is we have to look for many, multiple <coughs> indicators of whatever psychological construct we're interested in and try to triangulate on it from multiple different directions. That's the only way we're going to be able to do it. So what is this, some of the work that Tao has been doing? I think it's really good. So he did this study where he essentially uh, he went and scraped a bunch of blogs, and then he sent personality questionnaires, and he asked them, okay, he just, he just simply correlated word use with their personalities. He said, is it true that people with different personalities talk and blog about different things? So it's such a straightforward idea. Do they do this? But nobody had done it. And it's just such a brilliant, it's such a brilliant study. Because if you just look at the frequencies of the words that people with different personalities use, it gives you such a good characterization of what these personality domains mean. So, neuroticism, right? What did we say that was? That's a sensitivity to threat, a sensitivity to what can go wrong in the world. What are they saying? They're saying things like awful, worse, depressing, horrible, terrible, stressful, annoying. Right? These are the words, these are when they are blogging, people high in neuroticism are using these words a lot. 
What about extroversion, right? This is remember the Eddie Murphy fact. What are they talking about? They're talking about bar, drinks, dancing, <laughs> restaurant, <laughs> Miami, whatever. I don't know what that could be. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking, shots, girls, glorious. Okay, so they are, you can immediately see they're just talking about different things. Openness, remember, this is the Leonardo factor. What are they, these are the people in their heads. What are they talking about? Folk, humans, poet, art, narrative. Whatever, universe, literature, right? So you can see they're just talking, thinking, and talking about different things. Agreeableness, right? The Mr. Rogers factors. They are thinking about wonderful, together, visiting, morning, spring. It says porn here, but that's a negative. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Um, now, uh, now I know it, I, I have a. It, it is it is nerdy to have a favorite correlation, but I do in fact have a favorite correlation in the world. And if ever there was a single word that captured up captured a whole personality dimension, it's this one for conscientiousness. It's completed, right? Like, <laughs> like what that means? That means you set out in the day. You had your list of things you were going to do. You went through. You did them, and then you went home and wrote a blog about it. <laughs> <laughs> so like that, if anything captures your conscientiousness. That is it. It, kind of, it reminds me of this guy. You can see right now. Completed. I am done with that. All right. So those are some of the sorts of the behavior that's already there in a form that can be harvested. And we can use in, uh, creative and inventive methods. And I urge you to think about in your own research. How can you, what data are already out there that you can get, which will give you insight into the, psych into the psychological questions that interest you? But now, what I'd like to talk about is some of the new forms of technology that are out there. M many of them are not my own, but many of the new forms of technology that can help us begin to understand some of these new things. So, for example, some of them are, so is this is just a paper I came across a year or two ago, which is lifestyle chemistry from phones for individual profiling. So this is not smartphone sensing, which is what I'm going to talk about later. This is going, uh, going through swabbing people's phones and through a spectrometry, looking at the chemical traces that are left there. So these guys can, they can pick out up sort of the cleaning products you eat, they can just from your hands and touching your phone and on phone, they can take what you've eaten, they can pick up where you have been. So for example, are there traces of pollen or various other things or residue from things with inside the space? Um, they can pick up various medical conditions that you might have. So that essentially what they're doing is they can pick up a behavioral profile, not from not even looking at the phone, just swabbing the outside of it, essentially giving a trace into some of the things they do. Some of the work that Marion Schmidt Mars has been doing, she has been using game controllers. So we can now use game controllers that are used to control sort of you know various video games to try to detect various interaction in, in an automated way. Some of the work that Ryan Sherman has been doing with others, uh, where he uses um, cameras, where people, they're essentially life logging cameras. People wear a camera all day, and then what he does is he analyzes just what's in front of them. We already mentioned the, the electronically activated recorder. This is essentially a visual version of that, where you can just see what are the things that people encounter in their ordinary, everyday lives. Other people have been using things. So, for example, I spoke to a few people today in conversation who are interested in physical space, uh, including some folks over in the sociology department. Well, there's been some work you, you essentially writing a crawler to crawl through Google Street View to snap photos. And in this case, they're having them. So, this is a project at MIT where they're, in fact, having the things rated manually. But uh, it's possible, of course, that you could. Uh, uh, Training some sensing software to uh, rate these uh, 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 automatically. So, so these are two places, and they just ask you which places are safe, and you can have a huge amount of rating, and then construct these maps of which places you can feel most safe. And all of these uh, little uh, dots, the green and red dots, are the dots of the weather where the street view uh, has taken a photo. Now, what I want to talk about now is some of the work we have been doing, which I think offers perhaps one of the best opportunities uh, for, for research that is out there. If I was to come up to you as a psychologist and say, okay, I am a genie, 
and I am going to give you any data collection device in the whole world you want. Anything. I'm going to make anything. Right? What would you say? What you would probably say is, if only there was some device uh, that people had with them every second of the day. You couldn't, you couldn't take it from them if you tried to. They will hold on to it. They'll take it with them to the toilet. That's how much they care about it. All right? So you really want them to care about it. Not only that, it has many sensors on them. It knows whether, whether it's moving, it knows the GPS, it has Bluetooth on it, it has a microphone on it, it has multiple cameras on it. Not only that, most, much of their activity is mediated through that device. Their searching behavior is mediated through it. Their communications with others is mediated through it. The other, their health uh, behavior and the things, how they monitor their health, and, and many other things, their connection, their social media is mediated through it. And not only that, if you want, you can send them things and you can, you can activate uh, interventions through that device. We would be pretty excited if they said they could make that for us, the genie. If the genie said they could make us that device, we'd be pretty excited. Right, of course, we already have that device, right? So smartphones are that device. Smartphones are the device that we would want if we could have anything. Okay? And so I know many of you here are already using smartphones in your research, but I want to talk about some of the smartphone uh, research uh, that we've been doing. And again, I want to point out that this, is, this project is led by Gabriella Harari, who's the real brains and um, work behind it. But the idea here is that we can get so much information just from the, 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 the available on people's smartphones. So by building an app, and getting people to download this app on their phone it gives us such new opportunities for being able to assess what people are doing uh, in their daily lives. So really measuring real behavior in the real world as it unfolds. So what are the sorts of things that these are the sorts of uh, uh, sensors that <coughs> tend to be on that? What are the sorts of things that we can pick up from this? So for example, we can pick up social interactions. We can pick up conversations from the microphone, from the from the, um, from the texting. We can look at the co-location with Bluetooth sensors. We can tell from social networks when people are around, texting and things. The accelerometer can pick up things like physical activity. Studying, we can look. We can know, for example, from the, uh, from the sounds and the GPS where they are, and the accelerometer, what the phone is doing. Sleeping is a very good one, right? Sleeping, how do we study sleeping otherwise? Sleeping, is, in the real world, sleeping is very hard to study. But we know, so the validity studies have been done, right, showing that we can classify sleeping essentially when the phone isn't moving, and the lights are off, and the phone is plugged in, and it's at home, <laughs> then you're probably sleeping, all right? And then the first thing you do when you wake up is pick up the phone. You know exactly when you wake up, all the alarm goes off. We know about locations, GPS, and various other things can allow us to know these kinds of data. So I think it provides pr tremendous opportunities. And just to kind of give you a sense, uh, we, so we've done this study um, at uh, Dartmouth. And uh, this is just, a, we have a, a few studies on the way. This is one of the first studies we did, just to kind of give you a sense of the kinds of detail we can learn about people. So this is one student at Dartmouth College who was in our study. So just to kind of give you a sense from these monitors of the sorts of things we can know. So this is the student. So there we go. So they are in the dorm. And they have been sleeping for nine hours. And then they had three minutes of, conversa of uh, or being around conversation. Right. So then what happens? Then from between 9.56 and 11.05 uh, uh, a.m., we know where they went from their GPS. They were co-located around 29 other people, and they spent 95% of the time sitting. So this is probably in a lecture. Right. Next, they go here. So they go to the dining room. We know where that is. They spend 97% of their speech, there's 40 minute conversations, and they're co located around 10 other people from there. Here, then they pop, they go home a bit again, sitting down 97%, 70 minutes of talking, co located around four people at this time. Um, then, and so on, they're on the floor, they go, now here they're going, I'm not sure that's maybe the gym. See, they're very active, you see there's some running, there's a lot of running going on, 32% of the time. And so on. So you get the idea. So this is the sort of the level of detail, right? That before is this is not so far from what re was required for Raymond Birch when they were following him around with no pads of time. 
suddenly we're able to get these sorts of levels of detail that were just unheard of before. And so why are these things important? Well, so we know, right, location has an important psychological meaning. So, um, and so, so in addition to all of the other activities, just where somebody is can tell us something. So for example, here is a lecture hall. Uh, me teaching with Jamie kind of later. We used to teach a big class together. And we learned that, that where people put themselves tells you something. So you remember earlier I asked you this question about how, where you are on extrovert and conscientiousness, neuroticism, and so on. We've done quite a lot of research looking at seating patterns. Where do people sit? How is that related to their personalities? So extroversion, right? So who, where, who, the, would the most extroverted people please raise your hands? Uh, that, yeah, it's not too bad there. All right, yeah, so what we have found in our studies is that where do extroverts sit? They tend to sit in the middle. They want to be amongst the action. They like to be around people. They, that makes them feel good. Conscientious people, where do they sit? They tend to sit at the front. Right? They tend to sit at the front. Uh, and uh, again, and if you ask people, and people are very habitual about this, they t if you ask people where do you sit, they tend to sit in the same place over and over again. And, they don't, and they're not thinking, oh, I'm conscientious, where shall I sit? <laughs> they oh, this place seems the right place for them to be. What about neurotic people? Where do they tend to sit? Anyone got any ideas on that one? Near an exit. Sorry? You're exactly right. They tend to sit on the edges of the rows, <laughs> near the exits. You suspect what is your observation? Being sensitive to what might go wrong. They want to be ready to get out of that. <laughs> if something goes wrong. <laughs> But one of the most interesting things about it was so people do situate themselves with respect to um, with respect to the, the physical space. But another really interesting thing happened uh, when we started to look at the classroom TV panels was not only did they situate themselves with respect to the space, this was our lecture hall, they also began to cluster in groups of like-minded others. So we find that people begin to cluster. We find the people who are high on religiosity, they begin to sit in groups. The people who are high on political, say, conservatism, they tend to sit together. So, and I don't think, again, I don't think this is a deliberate choice. I don't think the conservative people say, well, where are the other conservative people I want to sit with them? It's just they come in, and this kind of feels more welcome. It just feels like these are my kind of people. And um, I travel a lot, and I often do, I, I will, in a new city, I go into a cafe, and I'll open the door and look and think, these are not my people. I get to do this and I'll close the door and go find another cafe where I can be around my people. Um, and, and I think, you know, so, so how we use physical space and location can tell a lot about us. So, for example, you know, people who tend to go to Starbucks versus people who tend to go to sort of independent coffee shop. I think those things say a lot about people. Not only for us, because Starbucks, you know, so people, people I think Starbucks are good or Starbucks are bad. It's, they, and that's because it tells you something uh, about somebody when they go there. So we did a study, in fact, said, well, can we look at this? Can we tell what a place is like just by looking at the people who go to that place a lot? This was a study we did using the, uh, the website Foursquare. So Foursquare is at one of these check-in sites. You go to the check-in site and say, hey, I'm at Starbucks. Right? But what that <coughs> means is you can go to the Foursquare page of this, and look at the profiles of all the people who go to this place a lot. So that's what we did. So we created the profile pictures of all the people who go to a certain place. So this is a cafe in Austin. These are the profile pictures of the people who go to a certain cafe in Austin a lot. And we're saying to people, can you tell us what you think this cafe is like just based on the people who go here a lot? Okay. And that's, it's pretty hard task. Look, there's a dog here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not immediately obvious how people do this. There's someone else there, there's a pumpkin. So there's all kinds of weird things going on here. But can people do it? So we asked them to make judgments on a number of things. They've judged the vibe. What is this place like? Is it bland, cozy, strange, sushi, douchey, meat, nasty, <laughs> What kind of activities would be good there? We could go dancing, read, relax, study, work, etc. What personality traits are associated with the people who go there, do they think? So they made these judgments of 50 different bars and cafes in Austin. And then, of course, we had to really go to those places. So we sent our team to those places. <coughs> 
And so we'd have to go, this is their, this is their own six read in Austin. They get, uh, so I send my team to all these things, and they're trying to rate them at these places based on going to these places too. And then, of course, we have to compare the two, and we find that they are related to, they're pretty strongly related. The, 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 the um, ratings based purely on going to the place and purely on just the photos, which requires a number of different inferences to get there. Right. A number of different inferences to imagine what that place would be like uh, are, are, are pretty strongly uh, correlated with each other. And, we, and, and that makes sense, really, when we think about where is it, uh, you know, how, how um, personality might be related to where we go. Because where we go offers different opportunities, both in terms of social opportunity and in physical opportunities, the kinds of things we can do. And we have personality, we certainly have um, um, stereotypes, right, about people from different regions of the country, right? The stereotype of a Californian is different from the stereotype of a New Yorker. So remember we have, right, we have the, we have the uptight New Yorker, New Yorker right? There's a stereotype of the Californians are laid back, the East Coasters are uptight, right? Is there any truth to that? Well, we've been collecting personality data on the internet since the 90s, and we have these huge data sets of several million people, and we know their zip codes, they tell us their zip codes. So we can do an analysis. We can say, oh, is there personality variation across the country. Is it true that the East Coasters are uptight and neurotic in general? Yes, it is true. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a heat map of, so the red is high levels of neuroticism, blue is low levels of neuroticism. Uh, and of course this becomes really interesting. Once you begin to have data at this level, you can combine it with the many, many other forms of data that are also available at this level. So, for example, at the state level, that is the state level of neuroticism, that's the state level of chemical-related deaths, and if you do the correlations across those, that's point seven. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that cancer causes neuroticism or neuroticism causes cancer. I'm not saying that, okay? But they are related. They're related pretty strongly, and of course, this is an ecological variable, so it may not translate to the individual level. But at the ecological level, there are very strong relations between this and many other uh, and many other dimensions. Here's another personality dimension. Remember, red is high, blue is low. It's a heat map. Which personality dimension is this one plotting? Openness. 100 points to whoever said that. Yes, correct. Openness. <coughs> which is also related to things like number of patents taken out, number of museum visits, all kinds of other things you'd expect them to be related to. Okay, so that was just to kind of say that, you know, where people go is something that is worth collecting. It's relevant to personality as one of your many forms of data collection. So now let's go back to the smartphone study I was talking about. So, we, so there's a number of studies we've done which is <coughs> writing one up right now are focusing on sociability behavior. So how can we get these sort of indicators of sociability behavior? Well, we, if we think of it as a preference for affiliating with others versus being alone, we can use the microphone to say, are they a round voice? Are they a round conversation? Can we use a classifier on the phone? It doesn't record what they're saying. It just records whether voice is present at the phone. And if voice is present, it says yes. And if this voice is present, it says no. We can measure co-presence with others by doing, for example, Bluetooth scans and finding out how, how, how many other phones are around and nearby. So what are the psychometric properties? So here are things that we never knew before. But we can now, for the first time, begin to get a sense of these, the, essentially the basic um, topography of sociability behavior. We find that typically, in this group, there's about 4.7 hours of conversation per day. About People have about 30 conversations, and they're co-located co with about 40 other people in this group of students at Dartmouth College. We can do uh, uh, look at the, the basic psychometrics of some of these measures and find out that in terms of the co-location and the ambient conversation, they're a reasonable retest uh, uh, statistics, not amazing, but, but reasonable stability from day to day. 
They relate to other psychological characteristics in the way that we might expect them to. So they're most strongly related to so people who have a lot of conversations. They tend to be higher on extroversion and agreeableness, lower on loneliness, and various other depressive symptoms. The uh, number of people around, again, so, so this is higher conscientiousness, which I'm not sure I would have expected, but I mean, you can can, of course, make sense of it, saying, well, these people are in the library or they're in class, they're doing things where others are, but I'm not sure I would have predicted that. Uh, uh, and they tend to have lower depressive uh, symptoms. So just to sort of go back to, where were we? Oh, yeah, that's right, I can remember. All right, the question is, we may have lots of these, um, uh, we may, to go back to like trying to capture behavior, what other technologies can we use to capture these sorts of things? The video stuff, how do we make sense of that? Well, we're lucky, we're lucky to also be on the verge of another revolution that's occurring. In addition to the smartphone, in the last five years, as many of you already know, I'm sure, um, a compu a computer um, vision or automated image analysis has made huge strides, has made huge strides. And much of the data that you and I are interested in comes in visual format, whether that's photos, with the videotapes, and we could, we would be much more prepared to collect more of those data if we knew it didn't require hours and hours and hours of coding and sitting there trying to deal with those data. If we knew we could code it at a rapid rate and accurately, we would be much more likely to collect these types of data. So, so there's a, a, essentially two different approaches to it. So one of it is the approach of essentially using pre-given landmarks asking the computer to detect the glasses, the hair, the eyes, the smile, those sorts of things. We all know it can do that, right? It does it on all of our phones, right? It can recognize us, right? That is a, the, the, our phones are very good at that, right? If we can, if the phone can recognize us and distinguish us from somebody else, it must be able to tell these things apart. So um, we've done a, a little bit of research, just sort of testing the capabilities of this automatic recognition stuff. So just to give you an example, so this is not, let me say, this is not our research. This, this is something I just plugged into the commercial thing, which is a commercial um, uh, tool called Clarify, which, um, which is something where you, could, you pay to have photos analyzed. And I just did this because it was very quick and easy, and just so I can show you. But these are the sorts of things. There's the photo we've been looking at. What, how, what are the words that it just came up with automatically for it? So man, travel, people, woman, leisure. So these things kind of make sense. Those are all there. But like, you know, like leisure, togetherness, enjoyment, right? So what it's doing is it's extracting, based on training sets, even like higher order things, right? This is togetherness. It is togetherness, right? But that is what this automatically det detected from the photos, of course, based on training sets. But it's able to get these things, adult vacation, recreation, water beach, group, summer, seashore. Okay? So that's pretty impressive that it can just sort of pick up these things. So we have been looking to see uh, to what extent can we, we use these systems to pick up things like behavioral residue. So some of our early work we've done with John Jones to know, we were trying to look at, well, if we can pick up personality from people's um, living spaces, can we pick up things like political orientation? Can you detect here which is conservative, which is a liberal person? And by going through the spaces, we found a number of things. So for example, people who are high on conservatism tend to have things like sports-related decor, event calendars, postage stamps. So these are things, essentially, it's things that are, that are linked to the things, the personality traits that we know are associated with political uh, orientation. So we know that on average, people who are high on conservatism tend to be low on openness and higher on conscientiousness. And so if you look at these things, these are kind of the event calendar, postage stamps, straight thread, these sorts of things, laundry basket, these sorts of things tend to be are uh, the tools of being conscientious. Right? So some of these things are not surprising. Whereas the people who are high on liberalism, they tend to have a fair variety of books, a variety of music many items of stationery, many books, international maps. They're interested in new, different things. So what we did in this study was we asked people, we just said, submit 10 photos that represent who you are. They could be anything. They could be photos of you. They could be photos of your bedroom. They could be photos of whatever you want. Just set 10 photos that represent who you are. And then we just saw, can we train the 
can we train the uh, uh, automatic image analysis software to distinguish uh, uh, the, uh, the liberals from the conservatives? So I'm going to show you the photos that people submitted. So these are 10 photos. So this is one person's photo. All right? So I want you to see how good you are at picking out the conservative people from the liberal people. All right, so we're going to go through 10 photos. This is person number one. These are all University of Texas students, in case you need some background. All right, so here's person number one. We'll go through the 10 people. Person number two. Is that person liberal or conservative? Number three, is this person liberal or conservative? <coughs> Four, liberal or conservative? Liberal or conservative? All right, so those of you who are paying attention might have picked up a pattern. It started out with conservative, liberal, conservative, liberal, conservative, liberal. So the first thing. even number ones were liberals, the odd number ones were uh, conservative. So what were the things that we found in these spaces? So the top conservative views was they have white people in their, <laughs> in their photos, they're uh, smiling, they're stadium. Uh, so, so you'll see these correlations individually are all very small, right? But of course they are. It's a complicated world in reality. Right? That's why we stayed in the lab, right? Because we wanted to make the world less complicated. Out there, it's a complicated world, but we now have the ability with the computational power and also the very large samples to be able to have correlations that are very low make sense. Pick up truck, rifle, chainsaw. <laughs> Uh, no glasses, border collies, I didn't know that was a speedboat. All right, we're in the top. Liberalism cues, so face height with this means, essentially, what this means is they tend to have more close ups. It's probably the height in which people tend to be closer than that means. But they have Asian people <coughs> and black people in their photos. Reading glasses, cinema, movie theaters, um, television. Uh, I don't know how many. Uh, but anyway, so you'll see that there are these different cues, and of course, the same thing for personality. So openness, people high in openness, tend to, again, the close up faces, they tend to have artistic sites, art galleries, art studios, temples, museums, objects related to drawing homes. So, so what we'd expect, the uh, <coughs> low uh, on openness tend to be wearing glasses, smiles, sports and cars, etc. So. So this is really just a demonstration that just from these photos that people may submit, and you could get them from other places, we are able uh, we are able to get people to um, this. This is work by Michal Kaczynski, which is shown just looking at photos. He's using, able to use automated image analysis to distinguish extroverts from introverts um, as well. How am I doing it? What time am I finished? What? Well, much less than that. <laughs> okay. Okay, very good. Um, so, yeah, so he's able to distinguish, he's able to distinguish um, uh, introverted from extroverted personalities, as you may know, right? He, he was got into a lot of uh, uh, hot water from being able to distinguish gay from straight people from photographs, even photographs that you and I would not be able to make sense of. And most of the time, we wouldn't be able to make sense of introversion or extroversion. So I just want to briefly talk about some of the challenges with this approach. So um, really, the, the pro one of the biggest challenges is dealing with the data. When you are having these smartphones, when you have 700 people carrying around smartphones with microphones that come on every two minutes, you have an enormous amount of data. So just processing this data it is it, it, it takes enormous amounts 
of uh, skill and I mean, it's something that we can't do. We have to collaborate with the computer scientists to do this because it's just way beyond uh, our, our abilities. So that's one of the real big challenges to just sort of doing this. You can buy off the shelf, for example, smartphone sensing uh, software and use those, but it really requires a, a tremendous amount of uh, energy and skill, uh, which most of us don't have. The good news is that computer scientists tend to be really willing to work with you. At least, I know it may not be true everywhere, but it's certainly uh, true in, our, in my experience. We work with computer scientists both for our smartphone sensing work and with our automated image analysis work. And one way of thinking about it is essentially, you know, you and I, as psychologists, we have questions, but we, we have medieval methods. We use the self report I and mean, it's ridiculous. But uh, the uh, computer scientists, they have great methods, but they don't have questions. I mean, they really don't. So in a sense, we give their life meaning. <laughs> and those of you who work with them will find that they are delighted have somebody that are finally going to use this thing that they have been slaving away at. So they end up doing silly studies just to prove that, that their method works, but they don't actually have methods. Um, I, sh I should say I, I can hear myself coming out. I'm not against self-reports for everything. I think self-reports are great, but we're asking about people's goals, their attitudes, their, their uh, motivations and so on. It's just for assessing their behavior. I don't think about it. It's self-reports very well. Uh, the other question is like how we have to make all kinds of decisions of one thing to get of how do we chop up the data, how do we change the data. So for example, this is um oh, this is, yeah, conversation. This is the amount of conversation people have. You know, should we be looking at over the course of a whole semester at the daily level? Should we be looking at the weekly level? Should we be looking at the, uh, at the average level of weeks over time? So many questions come up that we're not really used to asking. And a lot of these things, I've been talking about these classifiers. These classifiers, as though, oh, it's simple. We can just classify conversation versus something else. It turns out that, of course, it is much more complicated than that. It's much more complicated than that. So for example, things like the microphone trying to pick up on ambient conversation. Yes. It can pick up on ambient conversation. But it's not very good at distinguishing between is it's real conversation through an extrovert talking to others, or is it an introvert sitting at home watching the TV? Right? So a lot of these things are, are problems that still need to be worked out. And I think I think we have a good opportunity for working out that a lot of them still need to be worked out. It's mi missing socialization from people typing to each other if they're just messaging on their computer or, or something like that. It would miss it those forms of social building. So, these, so a lot of the inferences we make still require our own work. I think there are potential solutions to it. So for example, uh, learning uh, the user's individual vocal signature and just sort of just attending to those, for example. Um, of course, big issues, and they're particularly big now with the scandal of Facebook and elsewhere, of things like data security and participant privacy. This is going to uh, require that, that uh, IRBs and others go in and look at these things in a way that we just haven't looked before. But I really do believe that we are now at the point where we have very little excuses for not studying behavior in the real world. It needn't be at the exclusion of lab studies and so on. I hopefully it can augment lab studies, but the data are here. And it sort of leads me that there's so much information out there that we now can harvest. And it, you know, makes me, it leads me to the question of why. Why are, is this sort of data, the data we find in these environments, why is it so good? And I think one of the reasons it's so good is because we do this automatically. And we leave traces automatically. So I just want to finish by asking you one final question, which is about stamps. So I uh, want actually get this audience. I wonder. Oh, we'll all see. All right. So who here has buy stamps before they need them? They have them in their wallet, their desk, or something. So put your hand up. Proud. Be proud. Look around. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Who does not buy stamps? Who does not have them? Be proud. Look at the ground. Okay, so I'm, I'm not actually, I must say, I'm not actually interested in whether you have stamps or not. But what it illustrates for me is how things seem so obvious. So for those of you who, who don't carry stamps, 
when the people who did carry stamps around actually go, what? They, they buy stamps? I never looked at them. <laughs> that's beyond my record. And those people who do carry stamps, they were looking around at all the people who don't, and they're thinking, well, what do you do when you need to mail them? <laughs> and the point is that what you do seems like the most obvious thing to do. And that's, and it just, so it's something that we don't even notice it as a thing we're doing. And these are the sorts of things, by snooping around people's places, looking at the stamps they have bought or not bought, which, in, which gives us these sorts of insights into personality that I think are unique and hopefully will be what characterize uh, psychology in the years to come. All right, I am finished. I want to thank many of my collaborators. If we're allowed to answer questions, I would do that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. The question for those of you who didn't hear was what about garbage studies? Yeah, I, I, uh, and so the, uh, uh, yeah, I think garbage studies are great example. I've never done them. Are you experienced in garbage studies? Like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what, yeah, the garbage project, right? There was a guy called Ralph Street, it's a garbage project, yeah, who go around uh, as archaeologists trying to understand ancient behavior would go through the garbage dumps, and now we should because, you know, and, you know, I mean, as, as, you, as you know, like if you ask about, you know, it's the back door versus the front door, method, right? If you ask about alcohol in there, they'll tell you one thing, if you look at the can. Of alcohol in the trash will tell you another. If you ask about your recently, like, you know, cocaine use, people will say they don't make very much cocaine. If you look at the water, if you walk through the wastewater, there's lots of evidence for cocaine. So I absolutely agree. It's a, it's a revealed behavior. Yeah. I mean, again, it much depends, of course, as all the methods I've been talking about, it depends on, on the question of whether or not you want to be dealing with, you know, uh, uh, like from households, like you'll be dealing with individuals and how you tie those behaviors to mutual purpose. But that's true of all of our measures. We have to make those decisions. Anybody else? I was wondering um, what the age range was of the people in your sample, whether or not they were, I guess they were like community samples, so it's not just undergraduate. They, they vary depending on the study. So, um, so most of the smartphone studies we've done have been undergraduates because those are the people yeah. But I think, you know, that's one thing that's really uh, where the smartphone studies have a lot of promise because people, you know, by the, by the, you know, the many people logging their lives through their Fitbits and various other things, people are very interested in this information about themselves. And what all this requires is for us to um, give them a, an app to download and give them some interesting feedback. My, uh, uh, collaborator Jason Renfro of Cambridge has an app of, called Emotion Sense where he's, he's trying to use local signatures to detect emotional things and, and tens, of thousands, tens of thousands of people have downloaded that across the uh, world. The dorm studies I did, that was people in their early to late 20s. I've done other studies in people's offices which was like, you know, full range. Um, and most of, most of course, most virtually all the stuff we collect in a weird sample, but there's, um, but 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 I think you know collecting data online. So some of the, the geographic analysis I was showing are from uh, our, our online uh, personality questionnaire, which which you know we have data from all over the world. And I think we had sixty something countries with over a thousand participants. <coughs> you know, the full data set for almost ten million people, but of, of course most of those states. Instead, we have we're able to, to reach using these methods far beyond these because we're no longer because if you don't need them to come into the lab and just do your personality questionnaire right now, it really opens up the possibilities. I think that's a real strength of this. It, it, I was wondering, you know, like, is the is it just as sensitive for some age groups as it is for other age groups? Um, no, that's a great question. I, I think I think it's not. We've we've had people. I mean, it may be a little change, which is with this Facebook um, uh, data breach and so on, maybe that, maybe people will change. But we, we, at least in our sample, which for the smartphone stuff, which is mainly uh, 
yes, essentially students, then they you know, perfectly happy to uh, put the app, you know, download our app and, and to use it. But uh, but I know I know that there's lots of other people here with experience with smart home sensing. If anyone here want, want to comment on your own experience? Other groups? No? Not. All right. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, first of all, really fascinating stuff. Um, and I keep going back to the first question that you asked when you started, which was, you know, things about how many conversations yeah. did you have yesterday and so on. Yeah. Uh, and I wonder if you couldn't actually get validity data on that type of question using this approach, yeah. which I realize is sort of the opposite of what you're trying to do, which is to leave self-report in, in, in the past. But in fact, you could determine whether people are any good at knowing how many people they spoke to. That's the right question, yeah. So have you ever uh, um, had something like that? Uh, I, think, I think in one of our data sets, we have asked them various things. We definitely, we definitely have not uh, uh, written that up yet. Well, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that's a great, it's a great idea just to look at the validity of those. Yeah, it's a really good idea. Thanks. Uh, yes. Okay, so I have a question about, so it looks like you're looking at personality. But one thing I kept thinking about as these things were popping up is, have you thought about, or how do you control for like implications about like race, class, and gender? Yeah. So, for instance, in the cafe study, when you're posting these spaces yeah. about openness, like words, <coughs> some of the indicator words like how douchey this place is, yeah. like that's tied to ideas about yeah. a certain social class or a certain person. Yeah. And the same thing with uh, neuroticies and cancer. Well, if you are a low-income person who is in a, are trying to make ends meet, like you're going to have issues of depression and anxiety more, and maybe it's more a facet of not necessarily that like neurosis and cancer is social class and disease. Absolutely, I completely yeah, I, I completely agree. I I, I was try, maybe I wasn't there, but I'm trying to say I'm not. I'm absolutely not trying to make the direct link between them. I'm yeah. saying they're linked in a complex. Way. And I think that's probably likely. So we've done a lot of research, for example, looking at the at the, uh, the sort of the sort of historical markers of um, some of these current day traits. So, for example, uh, in the study we did in the UK, we found that present day neuroticism is, is can be predicted from distance to coalfields during the Industrial Revolution. With, with the, the theoretical basis for that being that where these old coal regions now, you know, known as, for example, the Rust Belt and so on, were very much associated with the misery then and subsequent misery with the decline of those industries that are associated with this. I absolutely uh, am not trying to exclude those those sorts of variables and causal of processes here. It's, uh, I, I, I may not have done a good enough job, but I, but I, I certainly think the sorts of variables that talking about are incredibly relevant, and they may, they, they may be relevant um, uh, um, you know, if, 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 yeah, it may be that in many of these cases, it's picking up some kind of proxy for some of, some of those things. It's a, really, it's, a, it's a good and important question. I really was struck by the uh, sheer volume of data collection, both in the three parties. Yes. And I was wondering if it was a, a problem, a data loss a problem, through <coughs> various things I can imagine coming up, phones using battery, garbage, reporting, et cetera. Yeah, so data loss can be a big problem here. It's a great, it's a great question. So, so, you know, when we set out, we have to make all kinds, because, it's, you know, uh, there are technical issues, sometimes the phone, sometimes the app goes wrong, sometimes they, yeah, they leave their phone somewhere. Or, so uh, so we, you know, we set criteria for the minimal number of hours of data that we before, before we'll analyze. But, it, it's, but it, that is exactly one of these sorts of new questions that, that, that we have to deal with. So the so minimum amount of sample. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if you could say a little about your IRB experience yeah. and ethical <laughs> considerations. Yeah. So the IRB is, is, is 
that you know there's it's like many of the methods in psychology is the IRB is sort of often trying to catch up to the to to the to with the method. Uh, some of the methods so we and we we have had actually pretty good um, pretty good luck with our our, our IRB. Um, some of the things we do are are designed to try to help that. So for example, in the analysis I mentioned where we're not actually recording the conversation, we are just saying, is there voice going on? But there are many psychological questions for which you want to record the conversation to really get at it. Um, and um, I mean, it, we have not had too many difficulties with our IRB. However, it wouldn't be unreasonable for the IRB to give us difficulties um, because we're getting all kinds of very personal and private information this way. Um, and, but I do, and I think we need to think very carefully about what we have to do to protect some of those things. So it would require a lot of work. So for example, in the work with the cameras, uh, you know, where, where people in maybe uh, being caught. So in our latest study, so the study I mentioned, the first study I said, set, send us 10 photos and represent who you are. This year what we're doing is we're saying, you know, where we, we we uh, send them a notification, say, where are you, what are you doing, who are you with, take a photo of what's in front of them, okay? But of course, sometimes people who haven't consented to be in our study are in front of them. So I think, you know, some of those solutions will be procedural in terms of what we can do, but some of them, I think, can be technical, technological, in terms of maybe, you know, of finding faces and, uh, and blurring out the faces, uh, doing what we can in the, to have the, the, the automatically detect, say, the agent's voice from the vocal signature and um, uh, to scramble all the other, all the other conversations to not, to not capture those things. Um, so, I mean, the answer is we have had an easy time so far, but we, I don't, I think many other people do not have an easy time and we need to do things to try to protect those. Do you have any, it sounds like you may have some thoughts on this yourself. Um, yeah. yeah, so like she looks at Facebook and yeah. she's already having difficulties at IRB. I know I'm not even doing some of this stuff. Um, some previous research was on self injure and so all right. of the data that she identified, they still argued that you could reasonably piece together who a yeah. person was. Yeah. And I think that this is collecting way more identifiable data, even if you're leaving out names. <coughs> Right. And faces, so I was just wondering. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, you know, it's the, old, it's the old problem with the IRB is where they're thinking about the danger, you know, of identifying somebody, but not building in the huge benefit of people that might benefit from the research should you be allowed to do it. That, that, you know, that's not normal. You know, that's the best you can Yes, I just one, more. one more question, okay. Well, the, just, uh, the irony is that uh, they, there is some discussion in the IRB, uh, through the medical, the medical side, which ironically would make it easier because they are used to exactly that problem of uh, dealing with big data questions in medical records at the very time. Yeah, but having ways of dealing with it and all that. Do you guys do that? Do you guys have your own separate or do you have your we, 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 it's not through the medical records. We only took from the medical records last year, so. Oh, but anybody, that's it. Awesome. If you still have a question, you're welcome to come up afterwards. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.